بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عباده الذين اصطفى اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blessings and salutations upon Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and all his companions, his family members, his entire household. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all those from the beginning who have struggled and strived to preserve this deen, and who have spread it far and wide, and we ask Allah to make us from those also who will preserve the deen, who will learn the religion, who will put it into practice, and who will convey it to others as well. And may we be blessed at the same time. May our children also be blessed, those offspring of ours who will come right up to the end of time. May the Almighty bless us all. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, as you know, the topic that has been chosen is how to live as a Muslim. And we know that the Quran has been sent to us. This Qur'an, very sadly, we are guilty of not doing enough to understand it. Many of us are in colleges, many of us are in universities, many of us have studied big books in order to pass a small examination of this world, and we've studied 20, 50 books sometimes, but we have not studied the one main book that will take us into the life after death, and that is the Qur'an. This is sometimes the plot of the devil where he makes us forget the importance of revelation. And for this reason, I call upon myself and yourselves to make every effort to learn this book, to understand it, to put it into practice, and it will lead us to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so we should learn the entire religion. Many of us make a great effort so that we can have a top degree, and so that we can get a good job, so that we can live the next few years of our lives with a good salary, but we don't understand, we need to make an even bigger effort to be able to live the entire life after death, which is eternal, Inshallah, in harmony and in peace and in paradise. May Allah grant that to us all. So this evening, I will be using the advice of the Qur'an. The, the advice of the Qur'an connected to how the worshippers of Allah should be living. How those who claim to be Muslim should be living. And this we will find in Surah Al-Furqan near the end of the Surah. And I will also join some verses from Surah Luqman because Luqman was a wise man. Some narrations say he was from Africa. And because he advised his son so well, Allah loved that advice to the degree that Allah made mention of it in the Quran. And from this we also learn that when we advise our children well, Allah hears it, he loves it, and he will reward us for it. He knows it and it will result in the elevation of our status. Because our duty, if we are parents is to try our best to advise our children in a way that will benefit them. That is our duty. So Luqman alayhi salam made mention, or as you know, according to the majority of scholars, he was not a prophet of Allah, but he was a wise man. So he made mention of these pieces of advice that Allah has repeated in the Quran. We will use that as well. And I may add in a few ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So to commence with, we find in Surah Al-Furqan, the verse where Allah says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا أَخَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا It starts in a beautiful way. There are many verses and we will continue inshallah right till we get to the end of these verses. 
And each verse we will pick up what we as Muslims should be doing, how we should be living as Muslimin. Ibadur Rahman means the slaves of the most merciful. The term Abd refers to a slave. Why does Allah use the word slave? Because it is the highest order of obedience is when a person is a slave. If someone is working for you, he might disobey you. But when he is your slave, there is no room for disobedience. Because if he does that, he is or one could penalize him, they could punish him because he is a slave. And this is why we are all slaves. If we are Muslim, we are slaves. Of whom? Look at what Allah says. Ibadur Rahman, the slaves of the most merciful. Why? Because even when we go wrong, he does not immediately punish us. He gives us another chance and another chance. And he is most merciful. And this is why at, right at the beginning of the Quran, it was easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Instead of saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahman ar rahim Instead of saying that, all praise is due to, you know, the creator of the, the worlds and so on. And the most beneficent, the most merciful, he could have said, the one who is very severe in punishing. He could have used those words, but he did not. In order to, in order to highlight that his mercy far outweighs the punishment and the wrath. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah says, my mercy has encompassed absolutely everything. So for someone to achieve the wrath of Allah and the anger of Allah, they need to be a really, really bad person. Because no matter what we've done in life, for as long as we are breathing, we have the opportunity to turn to our Maker. And when we turn to the Maker, what will happen is He forgives us immediately. With four conditions, and these are simple conditions. You admit your fault, you regret your error, you ask for forgiveness, and you promise not to do it again. Four conditions. Once that is met, there is no chance that you are not forgiven. Nowhere does Allah say, I don't accept this forgiveness or this repentance. So let us know Islam is based on mercy. Islam is based on mercy. Some people who follow other religions say that Islam is not based on mercy. It is based on penalization. The answer is no. Islam is based on pure mercy connected to you and your maker without a third party involved. You know, some followers of other religions, when a man has sinned or a woman has sinned, they need to go to another human being and confess to them. They will stand and say, this is what I did. That's what I did yesterday. I went, I lied, I did this, I drank alcohol and I went to the casino and I committed this sin and that sin. And after we confess, then that man declares that you are now forgiven. Islam says, no, you don't do that. You will definitely go straight to your maker in the corner of the night. Your sin is your secret between you and your maker. You confess it to no one, no one at all besides your maker. So you, in the night when no one is watching, as the hadith says, Sallu bil nasu niyam, you should fulfill prayer at night when everyone is sleeping sincerely for your maker. And you cry to him, you raise your hands and you say, Oh my maker, I have erred. I did something wrong. So you are admitting your error. I regret it. You are regretting it. You are regret to admit, you regret. I am asking you to forgive me. That's the third thing. And I promise I will not do it again. Four things. Allah says, my worshiper, I have wiped out your sin. I have forgiven you. Not only do I love you, but I have purified you. You are as clean as the day you were born. The sin is gone. And if you do good deeds after that, we will see in a few moments, inshallah, what happens. So Allah says that the slaves of the most merciful, who are they? <laughs> Describing how they walk. Imagine. Which religion tells you how to walk? Tell me. Nothing besides Islam. Islam tells you, you walk with humility. So neither do you stamp your feet, nor are you tiptoeing, nor are you rushing so that you bump into people, nor are you so slow that everyone thinks you are loitering. Look at the balance of Islam. You will walk with respect. You hold your head in a proper manner. You don't lift your nose up in the air as though you are a proud Jabbar, you know, someone who is arrogant and they are walking. Sometimes these people, they are walking as though they, they own the, that air wave, which is one inch higher than everybody else's. Don't worry, the air is not going to be filtered for you if you do that. So we need to know, 
A true mu'min walks with humility and humbleness. They respect themselves. If you respect yourself, others will respect you. When you do not respect yourself, you, no one will respect you. So if you are dressed appropriately, you are walking appropriately. You know, nowadays we have a sickness. I have not yet seen it, alhamdulillah, in this country. But I have seen it in many countries. You find young people, you know, the boys and the girls, but more the boys also. They wear something, a trouser, which is halfway down the backside. Halfway down the, and they are walking. Is that humility? Is that a Muslim? Is that the quality of the slave of Allah? Allah says, you walk with humility, respect yourself. When you are walking, you can't have these half bummers which are halfway down your backside. That won't work. You need to wear proper clothing. You know, the clothing we have, we are lucky. Islam does not force you to wear a specific clothing color or a specific clothing, maybe material and so on. It has set for you a framework. It has set rules and regulations for as long as you are inside that framework, you are okay. So don't come out of it. Which means today what we are wearing, mashallah, it's good dress. But if someone, for example, wants to come out and put something which is halfway down the backside, as we said, now they are coming out of that out of that framework. So we need to know we walk with humility, with humbleness. Also, when we are walking, what will happen? We will meet people. We will see people on the road, we will see them on the street. As I said, we will respect one another and we will respect ourselves to start with. If a person has a bottle and they are drinking and they are shouting at everybody else, you know how they talk with half the eyes, like one eye is this way and one eye is the other way and they're looking at you. They are not respecting themselves. So automatically, no one will respect them. If they tell you something, they, nobody is going to take it seriously. Because look at what happens. This is why the very next verse, the first verse Allah describes your walking. The next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the ignorant address them, they just say peace and they walk away. This verse has a deep meaning. It is showing us how to talk. The first one showed us how to walk. Now it is showing us how to talk. Firstly, we must not be the jahilun. We must not be the ignorant. I told you, if you are walking on the street, you know, with half your body leaning onto one side, with your fingers in front of you, you will be from amongst the jahilun. So when others see you, they won't take you seriously. In the same way, when you see others who are dressed in a similar way, walking in a wrong way, and they are people who you know, they, these are ignorant, they are jahil. The term jahil refers to ignorant, one who has no knowledge, he doesn't even know what he is in the dunya for, what he is in this world for, he has no clue. So if we have a person of that nature, don't waste your time with them. Don't waste your time with them. Just say salaman, it means peace. Look at the beautiful word. Allah didn't say when you see the ignorant person say war. No, he said say peace. Because we don't want to fight with others. This is why the English saying, never argue with a fool. People might not notice the difference. You know the saying? Because you start arguing. You fight shouting, he's shouting. You sh when a person is passing, they won't know who, is, who started the whole argument and what has happened. They just see two fools. Allahu Akbar. So this is why... Salaman. You just greet them with peace. What have you done? You have respected yourself. You did not allow yourself to fall into a mess. So this verse is showing us to be intellectual, be sharp, be intelligent. Don't drag yourself into something you will not be able to come out from. And don't allow yourself to walk into bad company. How does this verse teach us about company? It is talking about how to speak to people. But it has in it a message for me and you that we should not have bad company. Let me explain. The Prophet says, A person is known by his or her friends, circle of friends. So be careful who you allow in that circle of friendship of yours. Now go back to the hadith. If I am taught not to talk to the one who is ignorant, but only to say peace, how can I then mix with him? That's the question. If I am taught only to say peace and to walk away, will I ever have the time to become his friend? The answer is no. So that shows us that even our friends, we need to be careful and we need to make sure that we don't have friends who are bad. Because when a person has a friend who is bad, after some time they begin to think like them without knowing. 
The, everything they like, this person will like. Everything they don't like, this person will not like. You know when you have many friends and they are concerned about salah and prayer, when the time of prayer comes, you will be the only one who is lazy, but be, you will keep quiet because everyone is going to the masjid, you will go with them. But when you are a person who prays five times a day and all your friends do not pray, when you are gone somewhere, you might feel embarrassed to even tell them that, you know, I want to go for salah. So you will miss your salah because of your friends. Now look, I've just given you one or two examples because I want to move on to the rest of the verses. We have seen the walking and all the connotations or some of them and the talking. وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Those who spend the night prostrate for their maker. They are intelligent. They are the Muslims. And they spend it in bowing to Allah, which means in prayer. Why? Because we are believers. This is what distinguishes us from everyone else. How can I call myself a Muslim and my life is exactly like the others who are not Muslim? So what is the point? What is the point? If I call myself a Muslim, there must be some difference. There must be some goodness. There must be something more which I have. For your information, Islam is the deepest religion ever. No religion has taught regarding every single aspect of existence. The Prophet ﷺ has discussed the expressions on our faces. Imagine, you know, That is a hadith. It is known as a charity to meet your brother with a good face, with a good expression, so that he also feels well. Imagine when someone comes to you and you say, good morning, and he says, good morning. <laughs> what happens? He is sick. You are starting to feel sick. You are not sick because he is uh, greeting you, you know, like. But if you are feeling a little bit low and you say good morning to someone, oh, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Look at, look at the expression. You feel fresh. Just with the expression on the face. Islam goes as deep as that. No other religion does that. Subhanallah. Subhanal Khaliq. This is the greatness of Allah. If you follow Islam, not only do you become a proper human being, but you have the qualities of leadership. Leadership. You can lead any country in the world and you will be a successful person because you are following rules which, which really groom you to be a top person. That is Islam. The problem, as I said at the beginning of this talk, we spend days and years studying big, big books, which, which are of medicine and so on. That is important also, but not at the expense of our own Quran and Sunnah, which is beautiful. It must lead us. It must teach us how to lead our own lives. So we are taught here that true believers, they have a portion of time every day where they spend in bowing and in prayer and developing the link with the maker. I want to spend a minute to explain one of the reasons why. Today when we have work or we want to, we're looking for a job, for example, because we want a little bit of money, we will go to someone who might be the boss of a company and we will apply. When we apply, we will try to develop a link between us and them so that we get the job. When we get the job, we want to make the link stronger so we get a promotion. We have a promotion, we want the link to be even stronger so that we can be the most important person. You see? So why? Because we need a little bit of money and we need to live our lives. What about our maker, the one who made me? I know I was made. I know I am going to die. And I know that that life is longer than this one in that that one is, that one is everlasting. And this one here is going to come to an end. How can I develop a link with my boss in the world without developing a link with my boss in the hereafter? That is a question. That is my boss in the hereafter. So I need to develop my link with my boss in the hereafter. By doing what? I need to cry sometimes to him. I need to raise my hands to him. You know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we know this, Allah says, even in the Quran in a few places, that in order to test man, he puts difficulty in his life. Some people, if there was no difficulty, they were not going to remember Allah. If you are rich, you are healthy, you, have, you are happy, you have everything, you know, you have your boat, you have your car, you have your house, you have your family, you have, everything is in order. Sometimes people do not remember Allah. So Allah loves you. So he says, hang on, let me put a little bit of problem in your life. So at least one time you can come to me and you can say, Ya Allah, for the first time in your life. So it is a gift of Allah when sometimes he makes you sick, sometimes he puts a problem in your life, sometimes he puts difficulty. It is actually a gift. 
This is why the hadith says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. When Allah loves someone, He tests him more because He wants him to come closer. So now you don't have much time. You don't have health to sin. You don't have the time to sin and so on. Allah loves you. Every time you are raising your, Ya Allah, cure me. Ya Allah, I have a problem. Ya Allah, grant me shifa. Ya Allah, I, I really, I love you. We start to read salah. You know what happens? Uh, the youngsters, today we are speaking, I see the crowd is more of younger people. We have examinations. Just before the exam, we read salah. And we slowly, Allahu Akbar. Why? Because tomorrow morning I have my exam. And then what happens is, I will get up and I will say, Allahumma wa fiqni, oh Allah, grant me, you know, make it easy for me, let me study the right things, ya Allah, ya ilaha al-alameen, ya what, what, and we are crying, please. The next day we write the exam, it was easy, the results come out, that day we go to the nightclub. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> yes, we want to party. Is that a mu'min? We forgot. Allahu Akbar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that when a person is inflicted with difficulty, sometimes they call us with big dua. And as soon as it goes away, you find they forget us completely. You know, there is a famous one. When I was coming to Maldives, one brother told me that they are all little islands. To believe me, I did not know exactly what was going to happen here. But they said the airport is one island. I did not believe it until I saw it with my eyes. Then they said, you will jump into a boat and you must read your dua. I said, okay. So when I jumped in, I thought, you know, the boat is, we are moving. And we were moving and it was like jumping a little bit. And I said, you know, I know the horse moves like this, but I didn't know even the boat moves like that. <laughs> so what happened? I thought of the verse. فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Look at man. Allah says, when he is in the ocean on the ship and it is rocking, he calls out to Allah, Ya Allah, with sincerity that is far higher. The minute he comes to the coast, he engages in shirk again. That is the example I gave. We have a problem with examinations. We say, Ya Allah. The minute we pass, we are back into our bad ways. May Allah protect us. So we need to be uniform people, genuine, not hypocrites. Genuine meaning the same sincerity I have when the aircraft is moving up and down and we are worried and everything is going haywire. We have sincerity. We should try our best to be on the same path even when we come down. We should not join the people of Quraysh or the people of the pre-Islamic period of ignorance who used to do this where they call out to their maker. Once they get onto the coast, it's all forgotten. So this is why Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Allahu Akbar, for the sake of their Rabb, their, their Allah, they will spend the night. This verse also shows us that we do not use someone as a stepping stone between us and Allah. We as Muslims, you know, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Yesterday we touched slightly on the sword being used to spread Islam. One of the biggest evidence that that is a hoax is for your information, the largest number of people to enter Islam in any decade in the history that we know is between 2000 and 2010. Now, did you know that? The largest number of people to enter Islam on the globe in any decade is between 2000 and 2010. You tell me which sword was used between 2000 and 2010 to spread Islam. Subhanallah. Which sword was it? And one of the main reasons, if you ask those who are reverting to Islam, what is it that is so beautiful in Islam that is bringing you to Islam? One of the most important things they will tell you is we love the concept of Godhood in Islam where we have a direct plug in with our own maker. We have a direct link with our own maker. There is no stepping stone, no one I must go through. It's my life with my maker. I love him. He loves me. When I pray, I pray only to my maker. This is what it is. This is why Allah says, لِرَبِّهِمْ It is for his, for their Rabb only, for their maker only. So any act of worship, if it is rendered for anyone besides Allah, it is not allowed. We need to render any act of worship solely for the maker. We also learn that from here. On top of that, we have our needs, don't we? 
Everyone has needs. Allah created us with needs for many reasons. One of them is so that we can turn to Him. As I said, if we did not have needs, sometimes we would not turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why the next verse, listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Those who pray to their Rabb, to their Maker, those who call out to their Maker, O oh my Maker, save me from the fire of the punish of, of hell. Save, save me from the punishment of hell. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّ نَصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ O oh my Rabb, keep away from us, avert and divert from us the punishment of Jahannam, which is hell, hellfire. Because it's... Punishment is indeed very severe and it is a very bad place. This is a prayer that should be made by the Muslims according to this verse of the Quran. What does this mean? This means we believe in the life after death. That's what it means. So whatever we do, it's not only for something which is in front of us, but for the life after death as well. We are all praying to say, Oh Allah, save me from Jahannam. Oh Allah, when we die, grant us goodness in our graves. Oh Allah, when we are on the day of Qiyamah, make it easy for us to pass our examination. Oh Allah, give us paradise without reckoning. You know, there are some people, large number of people who will go into paradise without reckoning. No hisab, no, nothing, no account. They are fortunate, they are lucky. We make dua, Allah. Allah make us from amongst them. I mean. So it's important for us to know this, that a true believer will always ask the Almighty, Oh my maker, I believe I'm going to return to you. And when I return to you, give me paradise, save me from the fire. Now in order to be saved from the fire, it is not good enough to only pay lip service. I cannot pray, Ya Allah, protect me from the fire. But every day I'm in the nightclub. Ya Allah, protect me from the fire. Every day I'm drinking alcohol. Ya Allah, protect me from the fire. Every day committing adultery. Does it work? It doesn't. If you want something, like you cannot ask your boss, please, I want an increase in salary. But you are absent every day. You are sick every day. You have excuse every day. It, it won't work. So we understand it for the world. Why don't we understand it for the creator of the world? Amazing. It's a very simple logic that we understand it for this world. When you want something good, you need to obey instructions. Then you will get the goodness. So we cannot obey the instructions of our own maker. How? So when we say we believe in life after death, please let us prepare for it. Let us prepare for it. And preparation for life after death is not hard. It's not difficult. It requires discipline. That's all. It requires discipline. Just be a disciplined person. You have rules and regulations, follow them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your doors. The beauty is, Allah says, those who are concerned about the life after death, to start with, we will make this life easy for them. To start with, we will make this life easy for them. Amazing. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Then he says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا Beautiful verse. Look, Allah is acknowledging that we are living in the world and we need to trade and we need to buy and we need to sell and we need to do certain things. We need to have some wealth and that wealth needs to exchange hands. The Almighty is acknowledging. So he says, a true believer is one whom when he spends his money, he is neither extravagant nor is he stingy, nor is he niggardly. So, but he is balanced between the two. Sometimes a man is very rich, but his wife complains, this man doesn't even buy food for the house. You know, we don't even have proper clothing. So what are you doing with your money? The Quran says in another place, Allah is 
literally cursing the one who has gathered money and every day he counts how much he got and he puts it aside. The following day is more, he counts it again, he puts it aside. The next day he counts it again, he puts it aside. But you are not spending it. You are not using the wealth. You just want to amass. When you get the wealth, you should use it. And you should not waste it. So in the, in the same breath that we say do not waste, we also say do not be stingy. We should be budgeting. And this is why my beloved brothers and sisters, let me inform you of one thing. According to some narrations, to budget and economize when spending is half of success in livelihood. So all of us, we have income and we have expenditure. If we are true believers, we will balance the two. Do not live on borrowed money. Try your best to stay far from borrowing, from getting yourself into debt. Try your best to stay far from getting yourself into debt. Because if you get yourself into debt, you become worried. You become depressed. You are now living a life higher than your standard. Let me give you an example. Some people have mobile phone, but they can't afford it. Some people want to have a car, but they can't afford it. Some people want to have something, they can't afford it. So what they do? They borrow money, sometimes they steal the money, sometimes they do something else, then they need to pay back, and in the interim, they ask, you know, the money that was supposed to go for food and for school uniforms, or for, for example, school fees or hospital fees and so on, or lights and water, which is more important, there is no money there because we wasted it on something else. No budgeting. Then there is a problem, the wife is complaining, the children are going hungry, or the children are complaining, we have to go to someone else to beg, but you are sitting with so many unnecessary things. This is the meaning of the verse. Those who when they spend, they are neither this side nor that side, meaning not too much, not too little, they know what to spend on. So please, if we are true believers and we want to live as Muslims, we need to budget. Know how much your income is and prioritize when it comes to expenditure. If you don't prioritize, then the failure will only be yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Let's move on to the next verse. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا. Allah makes mention of three qualities. لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر. The true believers do not call out to any god besides Allah. So we don't call out to stones or sticks or human beings or trees or anything else. As we said few moments ago, when we are calling out, we will call out to our Maker alone. So Allah has decided that we will only call out to our maker. That's it. No one else. So لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر. They don't call out to anyone besides Allah. ولا يقتلون النفس. And they do not kill anyone else. They, they do not engage in murder. And this verse is very powerful because we believe that life is sacred. It is given by the Almighty. I have no authority to take the life away from anything that the Almighty has given life to. Believe me, not even animals, not even plants, nothing. Unless it is done by right. So by right, when it comes to human beings, the court will decide. That is the right. By right, when it comes to human beings, the court will decide on a life for life basis. Or if the law of the land dictates that someone will be executed for a specific reason, that is the duty of the court. We cannot take the law in our own hands because one of the conditions of execution is you need to have authority on land. If you have no authority, you cannot do that. It will create chaos. And chaos is worse than mass murder. To create chaos is worse than mass murder. That's what the Quran says. We need to know this. So we should never take the law in our own hands and say, no, this man did this and I'm going to do that. No, get them to the police or get them to the authority and let it follow its course. So we need to understand that. When it comes to animals and plants, let me show you something beautiful. If I have, for example, a sheep 
And am I allowed to just kill it and walk away? The answer is no. I can't. I need to have a purpose, a reason. The Almighty has allowed me to take its life away if I want to consume. And even then, I need to take it away in the most humane manner. So what is the most humane manner? I need a very sharp blade and I need to seek the permission of the Almighty when I cut that animal from its jugulars, from its throat. So I don't just hit it with an axe and let it suffer and so on. It needs to be sharp, swift movement. And we normally say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. We normally say, in the name of Allah, Allah is the greatest. Or we can even say, Bismillah. We take the name of Allah when we are slaughtering the animal. The idea is to seek the permission of the giver of the life of that animal because we want to consume it. If you don't take the name of the Almighty, you have stolen that animal from the property of the giver of that life. So we will not consider it halal. It is not permissible for consumption because you did not mention the name of the Almighty there. You did not seek the permission of the giver of the life. What gives you the right to take that life away just like that? You are not the owner of it. Look at how deep Islam is. And some people say, no, it's barbaric, you know, to, to, to slaughter an animal here. You know, uh, it's barbaric to do this and to do. Wallahi, everyone eats these burgers and everyone loves their meat. And where does it come from? They have all slaughtered the animals. Islam has the best way of doing it. You know, we always say when a person shaves, if that blade is very sharp and they cut themselves, they won't know. Five minutes later, oh, something is hurting here. How many minutes later? Some minutes later, sometimes even a little bit later, when you are showering or washing your face, you find burning. There are cuts. The cut is so fine, so well sliced, so sharp that you don't even feel it. The same applies to this animal. It has no feeling. It numbs to a halt. If you know the central nervous system, how it operates in the blood, where if I were to put my hand on a hot plate, there would be a message that would go from here straight to my brain. To say that something hot has hit the sensory nerves and from the brain it would go back to say feel the pain. So now you feel the pain and then there would be another message saying lift your hand. So you lift your hand. All this happens in a split second. But the message is going up and down from the brain. If you have slit the whole throat, the message going up is blocked and the message coming down is blocked. You don't feel anything. Numb to a halt. Finished. Subhanallah. So as I said, we can debate on this regard to convince the world that this is the most blessed way of taking the life away of any animal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Even when it comes to plants, we are taught to protect our ecosystem. You have the ocean here and the sea here. You need to make sure you protect the system here, the ecosystem. We are not allowed to destroy the environment as Muslims. The reason is... You know, some people think Islam does not talk about environmental degradation and the protection of environment on the other hand. Islam speaks about everything. The tree has been given life. I cannot destructively remove trees, but I can cut it down if there is a purpose. If there is a purpose, what is the purpose? For example, I want to build a road. There is a tree in the way. I can cut it down. It would be good for me to plant another tree somewhere else because the hadith says of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa you know, we talk of tree planting, International Tree Planting Day. They say it was started by the UN. That is a joke. That is a joke. It was started by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa a long time ago. He says, whoever plants a tree shall get the reward of anyone or any animal, even a bird that receives anything from that tree, including the shade or the fruit. What is this? You are a Muslim. You are getting a reward to plant a tree. Imagine, ibadah, act of worship to plant a tree. Let's be honest, how many of us have even thought of that? Amazing, that is Islam. Look at how deep the religion is and the faith is. So I cannot take the life if it is my religion to plant it. Can it be my religion to destroy it? That's a question. If it is my religion to plant a tree... Can it be my religion to destroy the tree? No. But if I have use, if it is in my way, I can take it out. Bismillah and I take it out. I am invoking the giver of the life. Also, if I need firewood or I need some form of fuel, there is a reason. There is a purpose for it. I can take it out. But I need to think of the future and plant more. Some people only take out, take out, take out. And you find what is known in geographical terms as deforestation. And at the same time, there are no other trees that are coming up. Then we are going to suffer. 
So we ask the Almighty to grant us intellect and understanding. This is the beautiful religion that we are following. Amazing. It's the beautiful religion that we are following. And this is why the Almighty says, لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس they do not worship anyone besides Allah. They do not murder. They do not kill. Here it is speaking about human being. And nafs means a, a, a fellow human. I spoke about that already, that the only people who are allowed to decide when someone may die are the courts and the, those in authority on land. And the true believers do not commit adultery. A beautiful verse. This is a reminder from the Almighty. True believers do not commit adultery. They protect themselves. Ask those who have committed adultery, what did you achieve by it? They will say nothing. Nothing. Few minutes and nothing else. We regretted it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. It is a disease. Adultery is very addictive. It is a disease that sometimes those who are involved in it, something big needs to happen to them before they realize that they are doing something wrong. So let us remember, Allah has made nikah so easy, so that we do not have an excuse to commit that which is sinful. We should not. And this is why to commit adultery, as we said yesterday, it is either with someone's sister, or mother, or daughter, or wife. Whatever it is, what if it was ours? That is the explanation of Muhammad sallallahu There was a young boy who came to him and said, Oh messenger, I would like to commit this act. So the messenger did not scold him and shout him and start swearing at him. No, that was a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told him, he said, look, come here. Would you like it against your own folks, your own family members, your sister, your mother? And so he said, no, not at all. So whoever you will do it with belongs to someone in the same relation. He said, I will never do this. Never, ever, not again. Now Allah is warning us and He says, Remember please my beloved brothers and sisters, anyone who has engaged in any sin, there is always hope for you. There is never, never ever a time whilst you are breathing. There is never a time that you are a write-off. No, shaitan makes you feel that now I have committed so many sin and I am very far away from my maker. No, we are all very close to our maker. Very close. But you need to feel the closeness by getting to Allah. Don't let your sin bog you down. Stand up and walk. You know, when you trip, do you stay like that for the rest of your life? No. You get up and try to walk again. If there is a pain, you might limp for a little while and after some time it will stop paining and you carry on. So the same applies spiritually. When we trip, we must get up and start to walk again. You might feel the pain. You might have to face some consequences. Sometimes you break your hand. You might have to live without a hand, but you get up and you continue in life. So the same way when it, comes, when it comes to spirituality, we need to get up and please our maker and continue. So this is why Allah says those who truly believe, they do not commit sin intentionally. They don't. They don't commit the sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, those who do do that purposely, يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة. On the day of judgment, the punishment will be multiplied for them. وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا And they will be disgraced being given entry into the worst abode. We ask Allah to protect us. Now we are scared, isn't it? Subhanallah. You know, the Quran is so beautiful. Every time it warns us, the next second, it gives us good news. Subhanallah. Every time there is a warning, Allah is warning us about Jahannam and hellfire. And Allah is saying, look, there are people who are evil. When they do this and this and this, they will go into hellfire. Immediately, he says, those who repent will go to heaven. So look what he said. After he warned us about these sins and the sin of adultery, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَن تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَّحِيمًا There is an exception. Those who will be punished, there is an exception of what category of people? The ones who repent and do good deeds thereafter. Those who repent, they believe and they do good deeds thereafter. For them, Allah says, we will convert their bad deeds into good deeds because of the good deeds that they did after the bad deeds. And this is why the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, 
atbi'il as-sayyi'ata al-hasanata tamhuha when you have done a bad deed follow it up with a good deed you will wipe out the bad deed when you have done a bad deed yes you engage in tawbah you ask allah to forgive you and follow it with a good deed and your sin will be wiped out so in this verse allah says if a person has committed a sin and on top of that they have engaged in repentance and on top of that they have now changed their ways and they have come a long way doing good deeds Allah says when they come on the day of qiyama the bad deeds will have shifted to the right side of the scale as good deeds which means you will have good deeds that you have not done in your account imagine you have bank account you open a bank account and you ha- you are sitting with $5000 and you look at the account after some time and there is $15000 you will go to the bank and say, well i hope you go to the bank and say where is the other 10000 from you know some people might keep quiet they say okay i just eat it you know but you, you you can go to the bank and ask them where is the 10000 from they might explain to you or they might say this is a mistake but in the case of allah no mistake allah says la zulm al yawm on this day of qiyama there is no oppression nothing at all So you will say where are these deeds from and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the explanation is in these verses that the bad you did because we loved the way you repented to us and only did good after that we converted it and we made it into good deeds so don't worry this is your balance this is your account subhanallah we would be very happy and from this verse we learn that never lose hope in the mercy of allah never i said it moments ago no matter what you've done allah is most forgiving most merciful turn to allah be hopeful of allah every one of us has the same access to our maker that the other has so don't think for a moment allah is far from me he is not far اقرب الى احدكم من عنق رحيلته according to one narration it's a long narration i'm only speaking of a little bit of it allah is so close that you know when the arabs used to hold the camels they used to hold the camels such that the neck was right here and they are, they are pulling the camel and walking with it the hadith says allah is closer to you than the neck of that camel which you are holding and walking very close allah is so close to you we need to understand this so let's continue with these verses Allah says wa man taba wa amila salihan fa innahu yatubu ila Allah mataba those who repent and do good deeds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah will definitely forgive them that repentance gets to Allah when you say astaghfirullah what is the meaning of it you know sometimes people say you must say astaghfirullah a hundred times a day so i don't know if it happens in this country but when people finish their salah they sit with a tasbih a counter and they say astaghfirullah 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 when when the when it's finished they are over and they go away and they are still engaging in the same sin why they don't even know what they are doing you rather say it one time properly knowing the meaning of it astaghfirullah means ya allah forgive me i am seeking your forgiveness which means i am wrong or i am a criminal i have done something bad so i want you to forgive me so therefore forgive me you say it once allah responds to say, Say, oh my worshipper, I have heard you and I have forgiven you. So if you say that and you say it once, you feel your spirituality elevate. You say it twice, you feel your spirituality elevate. Whether you have committed a sin or not, the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, used to engage in repentance sometimes more than seventy times a day, up to a hundred times a day, and he did not need it. We need it more than him, but sometimes one week passes, we did not say, oh Allah, forgive me, even once. it's a fact may allah forgive us all and this is why we find allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa may uh, meaning the verses that i just read before you now wa man taba wa amila salihan fa innahu yatubu ila allah mataba i've already translated that and explained it let's move further والذين لا يشهدون الزور واذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما beautiful verses look at how the quran in short verses is explaining to you how to live shahadatu zur means 
Bearing false witness. What is the meaning of bearing false witness? Watching the type of wording that you utter. Do not lie. Do not bear false witness. Do not deceive. Do not cheat. Do not use your mouth to hurt someone. Do not use this tongue to hurt someone. So if you are swearing, if you are lying, if you are deceiving, if you are cheating, if you are even literally bearing false witness, all this is included in this particular verse. You be careful how you use your tongue. Imagine, Allah is teaching us, these are the true worshippers of Allah. We are believers. We are worshippers of Allah. All we need to do, read these verses, look at them, think of the meaning, and ask yourself, do I fit? You know, one example came to my mind right now. If anyone wants to go to America or Britain, you need to apply for a visa, isn't it? You need a visa. What do they tell you? They have a large document. Bring this, bring this, bring this, bring this, bring this. You need this requirement. Show us bank balance. Show us this. What education? Why are you going? Who are you going to meet? What are the addresses? Who's your father? Who did you marry? Who is her father? And so on. Everything is asked you. Everything. Only thing they don't ask you is how much do you weigh? They don't ask you. <laughs> but everything else they will ask you. And what do you do? If you want to go there, what do you do? Let's be honest. I'm talking to you on a logical point. You will meet every requirement even if it takes you one month to prepare the documents. Am I right? Yes. What is more important, Jannah or the United States? What is more important? Paradise. Allah tells you, you want Jannah, you need visa. Here is the requirement. You will not lie, you will not do shirk, you will not do this. You need to show me your record of salah. You need to show me your record of your mouth. You need to show me record of this, record of that. Then we don't want. We say, no, leave it. Never mind. Allahu Akbar. Look at man. Look at man. Ya ayyuhal insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. Oh man, what has deceived you from your own maker who is so honorable and honored? How can we be deceived for something small in this world to go somewhere? We are prepared to do so much, but to go to heaven, we are not prepared to do even less than that. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. May we be from those whom all these requirements are met. And the beauty with Allah, Allah is merciful. He says, no problem. If you don't have requirement, just ask for forgiveness. I will give it to you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Look at the power of the deen, the power of Islam. We are Muslims. We are proud of our religion. And our religion is simple, straightforward, easy. The problem is we don't have enough knowledge and we are not prepared. Sometimes shaitan keeps us so busy. Morning to evening, every day there is a routine. We don't even spend a small time to try and learn the religion. Small time. If you start your day with a little recitation, a little bit of the meaning, and you look at it, wallahi, your day will be beautiful. You will move so beautifully through the day. So let's try this, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يشهدون الزورة They do not utter with their mouths that which is false, that which is not correct, not upright. We should utter good words. Even those who are married, those who are not married, those living with their parents, the others, we should utter good words. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا When people move or they pass that which is vain, that which is vain, what is the meaning of vain? Something unnecessary. It is not going to help you. It is doing nothing beneficial for you. When you pass through something of that nature, you just pass. You don't waste time there. Don't waste time with that which is not beneficial. You know, in life, some things will help you. Some things will destroy you. So those things which help you, you will be there. You will try. You will, you know, be found with it. Those things or those people or those times or those environments that will destroy you, you stay far from them. We are not talking of those two. We are talking of in the middle, there are certain things they will not help you at all. And they might not harm you directly, but they will not help you. They are not beneficial at all. Leave them because your time is limited. I want to give you another example. You know, you have computer games, small little PlayStation games. I'm sure all of us, when we were young, we used to play. And even some up to now, I have some emails I get. Her wife, 50 years old, she complains, my husband cannot leave the video games. Allahu Akbar, 50, come on, leave it for your grandchild, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> when a person is playing a game, what happens? Before the game is over, you want to score maximum. Am I right? 
I want to score maximum because my game is going to finish just now. I need to score 10, 20, 50, 100, 500,000 and win the score. Can you, whilst your game is moving, put it on the side and have tea? Will you do that? No, but what's wrong with tea? Anything? Nothing. But I'm playing a game here. Life is the same. Life will end at one day. We need to score as much as we can. So I cannot waste my time with something that is not beneficial. It might not be harmful, but I need to score my score before it's finished. So when my game is over, I'm happy. I can say, mashallah, I did well. Alhamdulillah. Now, why am I giving these examples? These are real life examples. We see them, we live them, we use them, we do them. So why can we not apply even a small portion of that to our religion and to our spirituality? It's important for us to think and use our brain. Shake it a little bit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Then the very important one. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُوا عَلَيْهَا صُمَّا وَعُمْيَانًا those whom, when they are reminded of their Rabb, when they are reminded of what is right, they do not turn a deaf ear and a blind eye towards the reminder. So when someone reminds you, my brother, read your salah. My sister, dress appropriately. My brother, do not commit this sin. We should not be from those who just say, ah, it's okay, you know, and carry on. A true believer will listen and they will take heed. This is why I always say, there is no point to say powerful lecture, good talk, but our life did not change. What's the point? There will be thousands of good talks. Today the world is in one in your hand, in your iPhone or your little Blackberry. The whole world is there. You press a button, you can collect anything you want. You can listen to anyone who you choose. You can listen to their talk on the internet today. You know that. So what's the point of having that in your hand, but you've never used it to change your life? I can say good talk, good talk, but what did I do? Allahu Akbar. I didn't achieve it. So the winner is the one whom, when they are told something, it affects them. And it affects them positively. And they change their lives. This is the winner. So sometimes the young generation, when you correct them, they feel bad, very bad. If you say, you know, my, my son, be careful. Don't do this. He says, hey, you worry about yourself. Leave me alone. I'm sure you have heard that answer. Who is this old man? So now the people are scared to tell you because they think that if I tell this brother, he will feel so bad he won't talk to me. If that is the case, we are not good Muslims. How can you? You must be happy when someone corrects you. If you come late to work, your boss needs to tell you, come here, you are late. I need to cut your salary. Can you say, ah, you are very bad? You can't say that. You were late. So tomorrow come early. When your mother and your father tell you, listen, my son, don't cheat, don't steal. If you do that, you will be punished. We will put you in that corner for 20 minutes. And you say, ah, this father of mine, I need to fix him up. How can you say that? He is telling you something correct. He is really correcting you. He, it is his duty. He is fulfilling. You must be happy when someone corrects you. You know, my father taught me from a young age that if you want to succeed in life, when someone corrects you, you must thank them. So even Quran or Hadith or anything, anything for that matter, the way you speak, your language, whatever it is, your signs. If someone says, look, there is a better way of doing things. Some people, they will tell you in a nice way. Some people will tell you direct. You know, some people might tell you, look, brother, you need to improve one thing or two things. Yes, you need to thank them. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much. But someone will say, hey, you, you don't know anything. That's their way. It is their way. You just listen to them. And this is why... We sometimes need to know that advice can come from someone young. If it is correct, accept it, even if he is younger than you. Let me give you an example. Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, he was a boy. He tells his father, Ya abati inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tika fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiyya oh my father knowledge has come to me as a young boy that has not come to you so follow me i will guide you if his father had followed him he would have been rightly guided subhanallah so sometimes it can come from someone who is younger so we need to know this 
وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا بآيات ربهم لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا And this verse also means that in the world when we pass through places where Allah has punished other people we learn a lesson May Allah protect us from disasters May Allah protect us from natural disasters. But sometimes you have so many natural disasters that have happened in your midst and you have not learned a lesson. We have not learned sometimes. You see people, different things happening. You know, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Aad and Thamud in the Quran. Allah says, وَعَادًا وَثَمُودَ وَقَدْ تَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ مِنْ مَسَاكِنِهِمْ Allah says, look at Aad, look at Thamud. Their houses and dwellings, their, the, the houses and dwellings you have seen, those of Thamud, and you can have a look at them and look at how they were destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكُلًّا أَخَذْنَا بِذَنْبِهِ All those nations, we punished them because of their sins. We gave them some time, and after the time expired, we destroyed them. May Allah protect us. We are fortunate we have that time. We are breathing. We are sitting here to listen. I know everyone who has come here to listen this evening. What is the idea? To achieve some goodness and spiritu spirituality. We want to go home feeling good. We want to go home feeling Muslim. We want to go home proud of our religion. Well, here you are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are good. Let us continue with these verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says thereafter, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا One of the last qualities mentioned here, a person who is worried about his family members, his children, his spouse, the one who is a true believer will make a prayer to Allah, saying, O oh my Rabb, grant me spouse and offspring and family who are the coolness of my eyes. What does that mean? Those who will obey me. Those who, when they are around me, they are an asset to me and I am an asset to them. When we get married, we need to understand there is a spouse. That spouse is very, very important. I tell the youth, the youth many times, you know, they sit late at night laughing and joking and sometimes, you know, just doing nothing very important, playing a game. When you get married, that must stop. You have someone in your life who is more important than that. So it must stop. If we do not stop engaging in the same habits we did before we were married, how will that marriage work? So let us realize this. When you ma are married, you, you, your friends and your folks whom you were spending a lot of time with, that must change. You must now spend time with your wife and your children. It is a duty. And this is the prayer that is mentioned in the Quran. Those people who are true believers, they will constantly pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh my Rabb, grant us goodness, grant us from our spouses and our offspring, those who will be the coolness of our eyes and make us leaders of the pious and the righteous. And as I said, there is no point in only praying when you are not working towards a certain direction. You need to pray and work at the same time. You try and at the same time you pray, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say thereafter? Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُجْزَوْنَ الْغُرْفَةَ بِمَا صَبَرُوا وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا Those are the people whom we have prepared a special place in paradise for. And they will be greeted by salam and peace, not only by the angels, but everyone who comes across them on that day. And they will be granted that ghurfa. A ghurfa is a special place in paradise. For what type of people? Those whom we have mentioned today, known as Ibadur Rahman, may the Almighty make us from amongst those. And we find other pieces of advice also. Imagine this goodness. What I have given you today, can I tell you? People attend leadership courses, they pay money to learn leadership when the Quran has it for free. Wallahi. People pay money to attend leadership courses. They are taught to be dignified, to walk properly, to talk properly, to dress properly. They pay money to train. The Quran gives it for free. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Still we are Muslims. Have we not yet realized that we have a very, very great gift of Allah? We have the biggest gift. We are Muslimin. 
We have a deen, nobody can compare with it. Believe me, they have tried, they haven't. That's why now they have to lie about Islam, because there is no other way for them. Allah protect us. Look at Luqman, alayhi salam. I said I would mention a few points. He tells his son, Ya bunayya la tushrik billahi. Oh my son, do not engage in partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he also speaks about being kind to parents. How many of us, we realize we have parents, but we are not kind to them. You need to be kind to your parents. Why? Because Allah created me and you in order to bring me and you in the world. He chose someone to be our parents. So through them, he brought us into existence. We need to respect them. They are the step that Allah used in order to make us come into existence. If I don't respect that, how will I respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, when they ask you to do something prohibited, you excuse yourself nicely. If they ask you to do something wrong, to disobey Allah, then you tell them Allah comes first and you come second. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us respectful and dutiful to our parents. Also, one of the important things that Luqman alayhi salatu was salam said, he says, Ya bunayya innaha in takumithqala habbatin min khardal fatakun fi sakhratin aw fi samawati aw fi al-ardi ya'ti biha Allah. Inna Allah latifun khabir. Oh my son, you should know that Allah knows absolutely everything. He is omnipotent. He, his power is absolutely unmatched. Everywhere he knows, he sees, he watches, he has authority, he has the power. And anything he wants to achieve, he will achieve. Even if it is a mustard seed's weight worth of something. In the stones, it can be within a stone. Allah knows it is there and Allah has power over it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who realize that we cannot hide from Allah. No one can hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, he also reminds his son to fulfill his prayers. Fulfill your prayers. Allah asks you very basic. Allah asks you a few minutes. Lately, I have been giving the example of how for this world, we can work from 8 to 5. I don't know in this country, I think it's slightly different, but we work whole day. To do what? To live in the weekend. Isn't it? How many days are there? One and a half days. Weekend is half day and one full day. So we work through the week to relax one and a half days. So all the money we earn is in order to live for one and a half days every week for the rest of our lives. And maybe at the end of the year you get leave. How much leave? Perhaps one month. So we work for 11 months to have a break for one month. Allah says, no, I will give you the goodness of the dunya and the rest of the akhirah. All you need is five times a day you need to engage in prayer which will not take you more than eight minutes. Then sometimes people won't do that. They say, no, that one I won't do. But your boss calls you at 2 in the morning. Hey, come here. I got some work. He said, no problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm at work. 2 in the morning. Why? Because he gives me my salary. That's the reason. What about Allah? He gives you your health, your wealth, your eyes, your nose, your, your ears, your happiness, your contentment, your spouse, your everything, your blessings. And then when Allah calls you, not 2 in the morning, but maybe I think about 5 o'clock nowadays. And what happens? We say, nah, let me sleep, man. It's okay, sleep. But Allah gave you the sleep. Tomorrow he might put one mosquito in your room. Your sleep is finished. One mosquito. Wallahi. You know the noise of the mosquito. Your sleep is over. So we need to realize this. And this is why we need to humble ourselves, bring ourselves down. So one of the last points mentioned in the Surah Luqman, where Luqman was giving advice to his son, he speaks about how you should not turn your cheek to the people. You need to be humble, polite, calm. When you are speaking to people, respect them, be polite. No matter what you want to say, there is no need to be disrespectful. You must, even if you disagree, you must be respectfully disagree with politeness, humbleness. You disagree with politeness. And at the same time, he says, don't raise your voice. Why? <laughs> Father telling his son that, you know, my son, the worst voice is that of a braying ass. What is an ass? A donkey. Braying donkey. Have you heard a donkey bray? 
Well, he says, if you are to scream and yell, you are just like a donkey. Allahu Akbar. But it was worded so beautifully, he's telling his son, don't be like a donkey. When you talk to people, speak with respect. You are a human being. Human beings, there is no need to shout and scream and yell at one another. Speak with respect. Speak with a good voice. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a lesson. One narration I will mention before I close for this evening. And that is a beautiful hadith where the Prophet says, Afshu salama. You need to spread salam. What is salam? Firstly, the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. But salam has a deeper meaning. It also means peace. And when I greet you and I say, Assalamu alaikum, it means may peace be upon you. If you look at what exactly that means in depth, in depth it includes peace be upon you from my harm. I'm not going to harm you. So it would also mean you don't need to worry. I will not do anything to harm you. If we are to say that truly to one another, the world will be a better place. We won't have enemies. I say, Assalamu alaikum. So can I backbite about you? Can I cheat you? Can I deceive you? Can I gossip about you? Can I spread tales about you and rumor? Today the problems are in the globe. What are they all about? Social problems. We have problems because of gossip, backbiting, rumor spreading, deceiving, lying, cheating, and so on. If I say, Assalamu alaikum, it's over. If I am not a hypocrite, I need to live by that. I am guaranteeing you that I won't harm you. Peace be upon you. So we need to afshu salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And really with these few words I close saying I have really had a good short stay in the Maldives. But I hope and pray we can come again and meet one another again by the will of Allah. For the sake of earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My beloved brothers and sisters, we ask you also to remember us in your prayers. Allah grant you ease, grant us all ease until we meet again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Then what he the or come here to get so Allah Jawab get could have a good call. Emma, if so to get Ben or Rangal go to a hippo or go to a no, I did make a Maldua Gulegotum. We have so out of your focus could have been getting. Emma, for to hear my cape with him before, never to hear my young him before. Park so while it magnus while it far and corvate before I dare you to go sing it. Okay, good again. Here's some questions already here. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. There is a first question which says Did God send all the prophets mentioned in the Quran from the Arabic Peninsula or Arabian Peninsula? The answer is we need to know from a geographical point of view that the whole world was all in one place. If you have read about Gondwana land and so on, uh, you will realize that the earthquakes and so on caused all the different continents to form and so on. So we will say that it is not necessarily the fact that they were all from the Arabian Peninsula, but rather Allah sent them to whomsoever he willed. Also, there are so many who are not mentioned in the Quran who were sent. And Allah says in the Quran that وَإِمِّنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا خَلَى فِيهَا نَذِيرٍ Every nation, they have, we have, they have been warners for those nations. We have sent people to all the nations and so on. So, yes, it may seem to us that they are from one similar region, but not necessarily all from the Arabian Peninsula. Wallahu a'lam. A uh, very interesting question, why didn't God guide the Satan to Islam? That question is very interesting and it shows me, uh, the, it shows me the mindset of the person who is asking the question that they desperately want to see people guided. So it's a good sign. It's a good sign because for someone it is as good as me taking the name of one big enemy of Islam today and I say, why didn't Allah guide him to Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what he is doing and he has kept shaitan as a test for us also. So Allah knows he has kept shaitan as a test and at the same time shaitan is responsible for his own doings. Certain things we will understand, certain things we won't understand. Islam, Judaism and Christianity, we share the common belief regarding Satan. And we share the fact that he was sinful by not obeying the instruction of the Almighty uh, initially. And for this reason, what we need to know is sometimes the Almighty, it is his choice whom he guides and whom he doesn't. He does things in a manner 
that we might not know the depth of it. We can understand a little bit, but what we do know is it is a test from the Almighty. And this is why if you read the Quran, in some places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the, the uh, discussion that he had had with Iblis. And Allah says, when he created man, he asked Iblis to prostrate, he refused. When he refused, Allah warned him. When Allah warned him, he threatened, he asked for time. Allah gave him the time. When Allah gave him time, he said, I will show you that I am better than this man. They will worship me or they will worship one another, but they will not worship you. So Allah says, okay, I will let you have that test. Let's see. So this is why with us, our whole struggle in life is to worship Allah alone. We do not worship one another and we don't worship anything besides Allah. We will not worship the devil. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. The question is aimed on behalf of those brothers and sisters who are under the misconception of Allah being the most merciful to mankind. How can he punish the sinners and disbelievers in hellfire forever? The response to that is Allah is most merciful, most forgiving. If someone is most merciful and most forgiving, for them to be angry, there must be something big. I want to ask you a simple question. A lot of us here have children. Do you love your children? The answer is yes. Do you shout them sometimes? Do you beat them sometimes? The answer is yes. Why? Because I love them. Isn't it? So sometimes when you punish someone, it's not showing that you hate them or you are this or that. It's just for some reason. I have given you a human example. It is not fit for Allah, but it is only drawing to your attention that sometimes Allah has a different purpose. And He knows. He wants to prove something. And what Allah will do with certain people, only He knows. So whatever His mercy dictates... If his mercy dictates that they should, people should be forgiven, they will be forgiven. And if his mercy dictates that they should go to the fire, I am just praying that I am not from amongst them and you are not from amongst them. So we ask the Almighty to grant us goodness and to open our doors. Sometimes we may not understand, as I said, the depth of it. And for your information, the Christians and the Jews, they also believe the same thing. So it's not just the Muslims. In fact, people of other faiths also believe the same thing. When I was at school, I had one friend. He is now a very big priest, very big uh, Christian man. He's a very big priest. So he used to tell me that time, you know, you are such a good man. You don't lie. You don't do this. You don't, but you are still going to hell. <laughs> That's what he told me. So he said, so I just want you to accept Jesus. If you accept Jesus, you will be saved. Listen, listen to the words. This is a reality. It's a true story that happened to me. So I told him with his name, I said, you know what? And he was crying. I, honest with you, he was crying. Me meaning he really wanted it, you know. I told him, I said, you know what? Exactly what you told me, I want to repeat it to you. You must accept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I have accepted Jesus a long time ago. He told me, you accept Jesus as your savior? I said, I accept my maker as my savior. Who made me will save me. Whoever made me will save me. That is me. And as for you, you have not accepted Muhammad. May peace be upon him. As for Jesus, we accept him as a messenger. We accept him as a high ranking, one of the top five messengers. We accept him as having come with miracles and so many different things he has brought, he has come with and so on. So uh, this is why I said he continued to tell me you will go to hell. But I did not tell him where he will go because to be honest with you, I don't know what condition he will die on. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to guide them all. There are many questions. I think we won't be able to take all of them. So yeah. we will try to take some inshallah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We all know that the Almighty is one. Uh, why do we sometimes call him or why does he refer to himself as we sometimes? Uh, that's a matter of the language. Uh, sometimes in respect, we use plural to refer to one person. And I think it happens in many languages. Uh, even maybe in your language, when you are talking to a person uh, who is very high, maybe you might use plural. Am I right? You might sometimes use a plural when you, instead of saying you, English language is quite disrespectful. To be honest with you, 
I don't think it has that high level of respect. Because even in Arabic, you can say anta or antum. So when you are speaking to someone, kayfa halukum, you know, how are you, instead of kihalak. You know, imagine there is a big man and you say kihalak. You know, <coughs> rather than that, you say kayfa halukum, you know, which means you, one man. It doesn't mean he's big, but it means he's one man. So uh, the, the, this is known as the royal we in the English language, the royal we. When the queen talks, she says, we have done this and we have done that. It's the queen. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, he says, nahnu, in a lot of places. And it is him. I, I was looking, I was in one library in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago. And I was looking at some of the letters written by the kings. All of them write nahnu and the name. Nahnu, Abdullah ibn Fulan, like that. They write we. But it is actually I. So this is just a matter of language. It is no, you know, some of the Christians try to tell us that this proves Trinity. No, it doesn't. May Allah protect us. Yes. Okay, brother. Uh, we all, uh, we all listeners, thank you from our bottom, bottom of our heart for your uh, good words and uh, many remembrance of how to be a proper Muslim. So I don't want to delay too much here and we really thank you. And Oh, there's a question. You want to love that? We will attend it. <laughs> okay. See, yeah, this is women's rights. No, no problem. We, <laughs> women's rights is such that we go out of our way after the end of <laughs> okay. time also to cater for women, inshallah. <laughs> okay. okay um, uh, living in Lebanon, this is my experience that uh, we used to dislike being bombarded by the Israelis. And it's only much later that I begin to realize through reading that uh, we, we have to believe in all the prophets. And that the father of the prophets, like for example, we have to respect Ishaq, Yaqub, Yusuf, and um, uh, Ismail on this side, and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, uh, I look forward to the day when we are going to see Isa, alayhi salam, descend and implement the Sharia according to Muhammad's uh, wasallam's way. But uh, re recently I have heard in the media a couple of comments uh, like, for example, our past, our ex-president's version of the Sharia, uh, should we adopt it? This would be like adopting the translation of the Quran and passing it on to the next generation, you know? I, I mean, uh, so, I mean, w but... These are very sensitive issues, I understand, but my background is political science. That is why I give you with that. And uh, the final question is like um, during in Mecca, when the Prophet first uh, was uh, asked to spread the religion, uh, did he uh, destroy the idols? Oh, only when he, for example, it took him 13 years, for example, to strengthen uh, Islam's Tawheed, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, then only he became a governor. And then when he came, he came with mercy and forgiveness, and then he did that. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much for that. And I think it was divided into three sections. Firstly, we definitely believe in all the messengers and we respect everyone, all the messengers and even, uh, you know, the, 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 we, 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 those, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was from the family of Ismail and even those who were from the family of Ishaq, we respect the messengers. Uh, however, we still believe that Whoever was present at the time of Moses was supposed to be a follower of Musa alayhi salam. Once the next messenger was sent, then we had to get to the next messenger. They taught that the next messenger is going to come, so you have to follow that one. So those who didn't, they lagged behind. For example, when Jesus, may peace be upon him, came, those who accepted him were now known as Christians, and those who didn't remained Jews. But who accepted him? It was a bulk of the Jews. Isa alayhi salam was sent to the Jews. He was sent to the children of Israel, which means the children of Yaqub alayhi salatu was salam. And for your information, the word Israel, it comes from the name of Yaqub alayhi salam. That was another name which is used in the Quran in so many places. So we respect them, but we believe that they, they, they were supposed to have moved to the next prophet. If they didn't, we believe and we have the freedom to believe that they were wrong. And if they believe that they were right, they have the freedom to believe that they were right. 
and they can continue in their way as we said yesterday lakum dinukum waliyadin you have your faith we have ours then when muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent he was sent there was a difference he was sent to entire mankind and just to bring in what you made mention of from the very beginning he had the quality of mercy and so on because we know he was so tolerant even the people of taif when they beat him up he only prayed for them and he prayed for their offspring and he had the quality even the fact that he went to retaliate and he went to reclaim what they had lost it was also part of mercy when someone steals your house uh does it mean you must just let it pass i'm merciful if that was the case then it wouldn't really you would be a person downtrodden you know let me quickly give you another example it might take me 2 minutes but i think it's on a lighter note people will enjoy this example they say that the one man one young boy was told that there are three very pious people in this masjid so they are so pious they just do dhikr of allah and, and they are so engrossed that they won't even notice what you do to them and they are full of mercy So the man the young boy said I will try that I will test it. So he went and he greeted the first man sitting on the on the left he said assalamu alaikum. That man he was so busy he didn't hear. So this young boy greeted two three times then he gave that man one clap. This this pious man didn't even notice. No he he was clapped on his cheek but he didn't notice anything he continued. So the boy was convinced he said these people are full of mercy number one and they are very very pious and they are close to Allah and look I have beat him and he didn't even notice. So someone told him the one next to him is bigger than him more pious. So he was so happy he went assalamu alaikum. And this man was very busy and he tried to attract his attention and after a while he gave him one clap. That man looked up and said son how is your hand? Did you get hurt? son how is your hand did you get hurt so he says wow wow this man is wali you know he's saint look at him i firstly i gave him a hiding and he's worried about me not about him so someone told him hang on that last one is even bigger saint go and see so he said okay let me go so same thing happened and after a while he gave the last man one clap that man got up and gave him two claps <laughs> so this boy was shocked he said hey How come you are smacking me he said someone needs to stop you <laughs> That is part of mercy if you like this you will carry on to smack the whole world so remember sometimes Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam obviously this is an example on a lighter note but I am trying to raise a point that it does not mean that someone is not merciful because they have uh, reprimanded someone or gone to reclaim something that was theirs So what we need to know when he came back to Makkah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had authority and the first thing he did in authority was he destroyed the idols and so on and he lifted up the deen and even those people who were not accepting the faith at the time he had made an announcement to say if you put your weapons down we will not fight you and there is a great story of the key of the Kaaba where uh, uh, some of the sahaba radhiyallahu anhum had taken the key away and nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed the key to be given back to the one who had had it as a result that entire family accepted the islam and they accepted him as a messenger after they saw his goodness and so on so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very very broad in that as well getting to the question regarding applying an application of the sharia the sharia to be honest we as muslims believe that the solution to mankind is in the application of the sharia finished we stop there with one full stop whether they it is being applied or not that is what is on the ground but if you want to find solutions to the problems you know the more we are going into these different laws the more problems we are having there is more divorce more robbery more murder more today than anywhere else and for your information the countries that are claiming to be the fathers of modernity and democracy they have the biggest criminal rates compared to any other country that is a sign subhanallah so as we say lakum dinukum waliyadin you have your way you want to choose it choose it we have our way what we believe is the correct solution it is the solution so we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to grant us deep understanding because we don't want to impose things on people and we do not want them to impose things on us and this is the policy of islam jazakumullah khair i think with that we can come to an end due to time constraints and if you can excuse us shukran okay once again jazakallah khairan kaseeran and akhir dawana walhamdulillah rabbil alamin